It's uh, Wednesday as I'm recording this. So if you're catching it late, well, then it's not Wednesday for you. But either way, hey, it's Daishian Miller, and we're here with our Whiteboard Wednesday, Four Years Whiteboard Wednesday. And this is actually part two of something I started last week. So if you watch that, you're going to like this, right? This is another aspect of our San Uch, our triple striking, right? So some people might say strike combinations or whatever, but there's a couple of different ways to apply this, right? So uh, a lot of the uh, emails that I get or questions I get from students and whatnot include things like, uh, how do I punch with more power? How do I make my strikes more effective? Those kind of things, right? Along those lines, right? So we're going to take a look at that, um, recognizing that things like power are subjective, right? Because power could be, uh, you know, a uh, it could have to do with force, but at the same time, it could have to do with your ability to uh, be effective, be targeted, the results you're creating, uh, your adaptability to the situation, right? That kind of personal power, your ability to produce results, those kind of things, right? So um, so we're going to look at these things, but at the same time, we're talking about power or anything like that, right? We want to make sure that uh, we also are not violating some of the other uh, strategic and tactical rules uh, that you know are involved in mastery, like uh, tells, right? I mean, anybody can punch powerfully. You just wind up like a baseball pitcher and throw this thing in. The problem with that is he's going to see it coming. If he can see, if he can see it coming, what's going to happen, right? He's going to resist. He's going to block. He's going to avoid, right? He's going to counter because you're just you're screaming. I mean, that's like walking down the street. And, you know, let's say I'm the thug, right? Um, you know, instead of, instead of a surprise attack and jumping on somebody, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to scream for, uh, scream to him from across the street. Hey, two minutes, I'm coming, right? If he's still standing there two minutes from now, he's a freaking moron, right? Same thing for us. A lot of people train based on this subconscious or unconscious belief, and maybe it's conscious, right? That they're going to have time. They're going to have all kinds of advantages because they've got some super duper color around their waist or whatever, right? Sorry, folks, just ain't so, right? So anyway, so um, we're going to have, uh, we, we started this a couple of episodes ago. We're going to have a worksheet for you for this lesson. So uh, I'm not sure if we're going to put it a card up in the corner up here, or it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a link down in the description, probably a link down in the description, right? You'll be able to go over to the website and uh, and grab this worksheet that's an outline for this thing. So uh, whether or not we ever work together, you've got this thing, you can add it to your notes, you can add it to your training, and you'll be able to, and you'll be good to go, okay? So... <clears throat> Before we jump into this idea of sanchin or or combination striking, right? Uh, last episode, and if you haven't seen that, uh, I'll I'll put up a little link or whatever. There'll definitely be stuff down in the in the description, right? Uh, so you can go and watch last week's uh, episode for this other way of applying this triple striking, right? Um, but with this one, what we're going to do is take a look at uh, what's really happening is instead of it being different targets, but we're engaging three times every time or we're tagging them three times every time we engage, we're still going to do that three or more times every time we engage. But now instead of it being targets that are related to to a previous strike and a karmic flow, that kind of thing, still karmic flow. But what we're looking at now is three or more strikes, one target, right? One particular target. OK, so we'll explore a couple of different ways to look at this. I'll give you a couple of examples, uh, just kind of shadow boxing here, and then you'll be able to go and run with it. Of course, there's a link down here as well that if you want to join us for our Friday virtual class, uh, you know, there's information over there as well, because we're going to be taking this to the next level and we're going to show you how to apply it. We'll give you models and all that kind of stuff. Either way. Right. Don't worry about that for the moment. Right. So here's the question. Right. Why would we use this kind of a thing? Right. Other than like I'm the baddest mofo on the block and I just want to be able to show my skills and look like Jackie Chan or Jet Li in the movies or whatever. Right. Why would I want to do this? OK, a couple of reasons. Right. One, we're smaller or weaker than uh, our attacker. Right. He could be bigger and broader. Right. So therefore more natural uh, armor kind of thing. Right. Uh, he could just be more solid. Right. Uh, he could be an MMA fighter where uh, he's used to getting hit a lot. Right. And so his body's just more conditioned to that. And I'm going to have to I'm going to have to apply a different strategy because he's just used to getting hit. Right. I could be weaker because I'm ill. Right. Uh, I got the flu, whatever. I'm on the way to the to the pharmacy or the apothecary or whatever to, to pick up my meds. And that's when I get jumped. So I just I just don't have it in me to be slamming as hard as I would be in the dojo. All that stuff that makes me feel all warm and fuzzy and makes me feel like a master and all that kind of stuff. Right. I just don't have it. Right. Or. Right. Walk and talk an example. I'm coming up on 60. Right. I know I don't act like it. Right. 60 going on seven. Right. Um, but he's younger, 
20 something, whatever. And I, I better have a different, um, you know, trick up my sleeve. Right. Uh, I could be trying to mask force. Okay? Remember, we're not just defending against this person. We're also defending against the perceptions of any witnesses and whatnot, right? So if I'm out here just hauling off and slamming the crap out of somebody and I win, if they turned around and didn't see him throw the first attack, I could find myself defending against the legal system, right? So I have to worry about that kind of stuff. So I might want to mask force, okay? Um, this also goes into masking it for him because if he can see it, if he can feel the intent, that kind of thing, right? subconsciously, unconsciously, before he ever consciously recognizes it, his body's going to start responding to it. And I need to be able to mask that and hide it. Right. This is ninjas for God's sake. Right. The higher shit. Right. OK. Uh, it could be a hit and run tactic. Right. Where I need to get in, do something and get the hell out. Right. Disappear into a crowd, whatever. I just need to slow him down long enough for me to use escape tactics. Right. Um, and another reason might be that we're just at a really, really, really close range where nobody or their mother would, be, would would expect that I'm going to be punching from in there because it's too close. I can't generate what most people think of as power in my punch. Okay, So I'm going to use it to create space, and then I've got more to work with, right? But it allows me to do something in a space where he wouldn't expect it, right? Which is always a good thing, right? Uh, next question, right? When, when will it probably not work, okay? Uh, just like the first one, right? He's too big, right? Uh, he could be so big and with such natural armor and maybe even a neurological disorder, whatever, where he can't feel it, that kind of thing. But it's usually about mass, right? Where I can't get through the padding to get to the ribs or get to the target or whatever. And the pain response because of his rage or whatever just is not going to cut it, right? So I may tag this guy. And if I don't even get a little flinch response probably not the time to be using this kind of a tactic, right? Uh, next one, right? He might be using what I call prison armor, right? Uh, if you've never been there before, right? Not that I've been in prison, but I've been through it, right? Uh, based on, you know, being a, a police officer and all that kind of stuff, right? One of the things that your training should, um, should account for is different types of prison armor. One of those things, right? Just talk about one today, right? Is where it'll take a glossy magazine, right? Cosmo, uh, whatever, right? One of these magazines that have like the glossy paper, it's thicker and all that kind of stuff. And what they'll do is they, they'll take one or more of these things and they'll open it up, right? So spine sticking out this way, right? They'll open it this way, place it against their body and somehow strap it, duct tape it, whatever in place, right? So I'm shifting. Maybe I do Ichimonji, Jumonji, no Kata, whatever. I tag and I come back in there and hit and suddenly, funk, I hit something that's not body, Right? I need to be registering those things, right? So now I'm going to have to adapt my top uh, tactics, or maybe that's not the thing, which is why we need to know about other targets and be good at these other things, right? Uh, our strike dynamics, right? Uh, we did a we did an episode a while back on the four different strike dynamics, which gave you 81 different ways to deliver any given fist, right? So if you haven't seen that, we'll put that in the description down below as well. Who knows? A picture may have already popped up for you, where they have whatever, wherever, right? It'll pop up. Uh, Either way, take a look at that uh, to get a better you, you need to expand your striking skills. Right. So that where the, the, the chances of being in a situation to get somebody where we've never seen the kind of punch he's throwing or that we can't adapt to the situation just becomes slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. Right. OK, so uh, there's that one. And uh, let's see, um, I might not use this because I'm just not freaking good at it. OK, um, and I say that because the number of people that go through a test like here at the academy or through one of our seminars or our long distance guys sending in videos or whatever, right? They've got this favorite technique. They just got to show, right? Except they're just not that good at it, right? Why not during a test show a freaking technique that you are good at so I can go, oh shit, okay, he gets it, right? Um, other things he can work on, but demonstrate the things you're better at, right? Not the things that, well, I like it and I want to show you that I'm working on it. Well, show me what you're working on. Show me what I need to see for the next thing, right? And this is, so it's bad enough during a test, right? Can you imagine pulling out something because, oh, it's this cool magic thing that I that I learned from Sensei, and I'm going to do this, and my fist folds, or I break my wrist, or whatever, because I just haven't spent enough time at, at making the fist in a way that there's fist confidence. What that means is when I strike a target with force, and against resistance, this doesn't shatter, right? That kind of thing, right? Uh, 
And, and that leads into this whole idea that your fist confidence just sucks. So maybe you're good at the tactic, right? We can do this thing, but I just don't have enough practice with my fist and stuff. Sorry. So my fist confidence, it sucks, right? Um, I'm good at striking the air. I'm good at soft training, all that kind of crap. But with force against resistance, shit just falls apart, right? Uncool. Okay. So anyway, let's take a look at something. These are some prerequisites that you're going to need uh, to have before you even move into this thing, because this, this San Uch, uh, just like the last thing, right? It's part of the basics. The, the thing we covered last episode, it's a part of the basics. It's part of Kihon models, right? But it's still something you need to work on. What we're looking at today, this is like upper intermediate into advanced levels and stuff, right? So it's not something that you jump into before you've learned your 16 strikes, before you've learned those uh, four dynamics, 81 different you know, variations and things like that, right? That's going to carry you a long way, right? This is one of those what if kind of situations where I need to create uh, results in very specific places, right? So we need, we've got three prerequisites, right? So just draw a little thing here, right? Because they're all connected and no one, no one thing is more important than the others, but they go together, okay? So first thing we have to have, obviously, right, is we have to know our fist. And that includes fist confidence. That includes uh, what, what types of targets on, the, on his body this fist is best suited for, that kind of thing, right? We need to be able to transition from one fist to another fist to another fist without thinking about it, right? And, and our fist confidence, our fist form is all good, right? So we're good at that. And that's, you know, there's nine on that, nine made with the hands. And then we've got these other things on the body. So we need to understand how they relate, how they line up, all that kind of stuff, right? Okay. Next thing, right, is uh, something we covered in a previous episode. We'll put that down in the uh, in the uh, description as well, right, is Tai Sabaki, okay? Tai Sabaki, not evasion. That's that bullshit uh, translation that people throw out because they think they know something or they got something from somebody they trusted, um, but they didn't double check their, their information. Tai Sabaki literally in Japanese means body management, okay? So that means we've got our angling. We've got our kamai right. We've got uh, our... our um, uh, our, our hand arm management, uh, te sabaki, right? We've got our leg, our footwork management, right? Ashi sabaki. We've got all that stuff handled, right? And we're good at this stuff because we're going to need to be able to line up with a target so we can spend an extra quarter to half second delivering two more strikes than we would normally deliver to a given target, right? Which means we need to be covered. We need to be at the right distance. We, You get the idea, right? Okay. And then the third thing we need to be good at is this thing called ma'ai, right? Not my, right? My distance, okay? Distancing, right? And when James works up the, the worksheet and all that kind of stuff that you'll be able to go to, you won't be able to go for a little bit after this is done, but uh, you can click on the link, go over, and, and, and download the worksheet, right? Uh, if you go too soon, you'll probably be downloading last week's worksheet. Anyway, right? So um, my, right, is, again, in that video that we did on the four strike dynamics, distancing is one of those dynamics, right? So I, I need to know where I am and, and which, which strike, right? Lead, cross, lunge, or whatever fits into a given space, right? If I'm doing a, a stomp kick, right? I need to understand that the spatial relationship for a stomp kick, there's some wiggle room, right? But the, the, but the perfect distance for delivering a stomp kick is in between knee strike range, right? Where I'm just too far for a knee strike, right? But I'm too close for a straight kick or a rising shin kick or whatever, right? So I'm in this pocket where an, an experienced uh, fighter would never expect to kick because I'm too far for one, I'm too close for the other, right? And then this thing just slips right in there, okay? Again, it's knowing how these things work and not just like, I got me some skills, really? At what level are those skills, okay? And how much do you know about those skills or did you just stop at mechanics, right? I know how to do it, so therefore, I'm all good. Yeah, well, there's a whole wide range of things like application, situational awareness, environment, all those kind of things make things uh, more appropriate than others. OK, so anyway, right. So Sanuch, right. I mean, this this whole concept, right, is in here. Right. But these are your elements. But what I'm going to be talking about today is a combination between the Ken and the Mai, this distance, because instead of relating distance, right? You can go to the strike dynamics and look at distance, my body to his body, the Kukan, uh, the space in between and all that kind of stuff. You can look at it there, but we're going to be relating my distance to the distance necessary or the distance created 
by the shape of the fist. Okay, so that's what we're going to be taking a look at, and uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so uh, again, hopefully you know, you know Shikan Ken, right? This extended knuckle, four rings fist is what Shikan means, right? Uh, often in the dojo, we'll call it. curling things, right, which causes things to collapse and, and things to fall apart. Let me just double check something here, maybe having an internet issue, and I hope not. Uh, okay, so we should be good. Okay, so uh, so you know this, right? Boshi Ken, uh, Shito, uh, Shuki Ken, all these kind of things, right? You, you, you know them, okay? And if you don't, well, then it's a prerequisite, right? We have to know them before we can make them, right? So let's take a look at a couple of uh, combinations, right? Uh, and then, you know, we'll send you off on your own. And, and, you know, if you have any questions, of course, you can always leave them in the comments below if you're on YouTube uh, or if you're on our Facebook page that we're, that this is uh, simulcasting on or whatever, right? You can shoot us an email at warriorc at warrior-concepts-online.com. If you're a local student in the academy here in the Seals Grove, Sunbury, Pennsylvania area, you can always ask questions in class. Chris McLaurin, I know you will. It's what you do. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, right. So we have these things. So I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a little uh, thing, right. And it doesn't require a lot of footwork, right. We just need to make sure that we're online so that I can go from one to the next, to the next. And the body dropping in provides that little, but again, force and power. See, again, it's relative, right? Because if I go after a Q-show, right, I go after a sensitive area on the body. Q-show doesn't mean pressure point. I'll put a link down below or in one of these boxes up here, right, uh, on the on the, uh, the the training we did on Q-Show, right, and the different types of Q-Show, right? But if we can match the fist to the Q-Show, right, then he's going to experience something different than what observers on the outside think he's experiencing, right? Because it doesn't look like you're doing very much, but what he's experiencing is, is, experiencing is way different, right? So in this combination... Typically speaking, the first strike is going to be the least damaging, okay? Because we're just kind of initiating things, right? But we've caused pain, we've caused some damage or whatever. We don't have to hit as hard, right? So we've done this thing, and then the next one hitting the same target. And now what we're doing is we're adding injury to injury, right? Not insult to injury, we're injury to injury. And then the next one striking the same point, same point, same point, right? It's kind of like the way diamonds are shaped by a jeweler, right? They don't just, you know, cut the thing out. A lot of people have no patience, right? So they'd be like, dink, and then the whole rock just shatters, right? These guys are like, or sculptors are working with stone and all that, right? Dink, 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 dink. And then one of them, psh, makes this thing fall away. And then they move on to the next one and the next one and the next one, right? It's the same thing. It's this chipping away kind of thing. Okay. All right. It also allows us to be faster, right? Way faster because there's less time between each strike. All right. But let's take a look at one um, that's going to involve two with the hand and then this uh, Shuki Ken, this elbow gun kind of thing. Right. Okay. So if I, if I'm in, we could be in really, really close. Right. And so I can't wind up, maybe he's pinning this arm down, right. He's, he's got some pressure going on behind it. So I can't wind up. He's got me locked in that way. Well, shit, he's already pulling on it. Right. How about if I just disengage the muscles and stop resisting the pull? So what ends up happening is he pulls my fist into him. Right. Uh, if you've ever lift up, lifted up something, a bag or a box or, or an item or whatever that you thought was way, way heavy, right? And so you bent down to pick this thing up and you braced for, for resistance, right? And next thing you know, it's lighter than crap, right? And shoo, shit's flying all over the place and whatnot. It's that kind of thing, right? So he's tugging, keeping me from winding up and all that. And so what I do from right here is I just drop this, uh, this shikan ken into the target, right? And if he's pulling to keep me from winding up, and I can also help him pull, right? By making him think that I'm trying to wind up to punch or that I'm trying to escape. So he'll put more pressure on that. And all of a sudden I disengage those muscles and form the fist and I create this first strike. Okay. This strike, even if I'm on target right here, right? It creates a certain distance, right? So people have a natural tendency to want to haul off to do the next strike. When the reality is, is that there's a distance for this, but See, my thumb tip is far, it's, it's, it's away from it, right? So from here, I can collapse 
the shikan ken and deliver a uh, fudo ken, or from here I can drop that boshi ken in. This is perfect because we're less distance, but more power concentrated on a single point. So hit, hit, right? Now I've created some more distance, right? Now I get my body in there, but again, I don't want to wind up because that allows him to recover at least a little bit. It allows him to see what I'm doing. And as I move in consciously or unconsciously, he'll start to avoid, he could block whatever, right? So one, two, and I'll just drop this Shuki Ken straight in on that same target, right? So one, two, boom, in, okay, to catch the next thing. Um, we have uh, in our module one, right? We have this thing where this guy's coming in with a hook punch, right? We've got this block and then we come up from underneath, right? And pop this Shaco Ken under the jaw. OK, so it's right there. And then because it snaps his head back, we come in and catch a different pressure point and all that. Right. That's related to what we were talking about last week. Right. What I want to do with this one is come up and catch it, but keep my arm going. But what's going to be important is the taste of Baki, the hand arm uh, management. So I'm not striking. Let me face you. Right. So I'm not striking like this. Right. I'm coming under this way. Right. So it doesn't just put more power into the strike. But see what's happening? The elbow's right behind it, okay? So what I have now is this shot, shot. And then from right here, because this is going to move him, the elbow's going to move him farther, right? One, two, and then from right here, and drop that hammer fist right back down on it. So it doesn't matter if I catch the front of his face, right? I might have dri uh, driven a knee in, so he's kind of folded this way, right? So one shot to the face, one shot to the face. Now he's in this position drive him down to the ground, that kind of thing, right? Same thing can be done with, uh, with the legs, right? So in our mod four curriculum, uh, we have strike combinations. So for those of you guys going through the Warrior Concepts uh, Mastery Program, uh, in mod four is where we start to work on these things. Well, we point to them because you've been working on them since mod one, okay? Um, but again, you know, the first example, we're in really close this way, right? Moving in this way. Second example, right? It's a more of a mid, more space kind of thing. But what I'm doing is I'm recognizing that, okay, this did so much, but if I haul off, he can get some of his senses back. And next thing you know, is blocking that next thing. So since my arm is already moving in a given direction, right? Just like last week, right? There's this thing. And then from right here, right? Because he's been hit twice, boom, boom, right? Now the face is here, hands already ready to go, or it could just be another elbow coming straight down, right? So it could be four, one, two, three, four, right? Uh, for those of you going through the mod one stuff and you've learned this block shot kind of thing, right? One of the things that we teach is if you hit and he doesn't drop like a sack of bricks or you can't get, right, to the uh, to the Jinshu, right? If we're working off last week's uh, exercise, right? So we've got this block, we catch him, right? And then from right here, we just drop that elbow right down the middle of the sternum, right? There's a break right here. There's actually a joint in the middle of your sternum. For those of you who don't know that, right? I can pop mine, really freaks people out, but um, it, it helps with breathing and expansion and all that kind of stuff, right? But you hit it, drives him into the ground, right? Or you hit, right? And your hand's too far away. You feel like it's too far away to get to this or you forget about the cue show to go after it, right? So we just hit come right back down on, them, right? So the idea is just this next thing, next thing. So in mod four, we have straight combinations. In mod five, we have kick combinations, right? Two, three, or more kicks with the same leg without putting it down. And I don't mean like the Taekwondo dance around, the doo -doo -doo -doo, right? Not that kind of thing, right? It's, it's this karmic chain, right? So between last week's episode, this week's episode, or lessons, right? You got that kind of thing, okay? So uh, will be another good one. Uh, let's see. Let's say I'm still going after the ribs right here. And so um, I come in with a uh, Fudo Ken, right? Got this, right? Uh, one of the things that most people don't know is that the elbow in Ninjutsu, right, is a redirected or uh, save, right, on a missed initial punch, right? Because we're, we're doing ski, right? If we're hooking and punching this way, probably not, right? Because the line, the, the, the lines and the reference points keep changing uh, on that arc, right? But if I'm moving in straight, right? If I hit, 
the elbow is right there and I can keep on going, right? I can keep on going. If he moves, if he slips this one, right, I've got another opportunity to hit, right? As soon as I realize he's slipping, I just stick my arm out to the side, right? So now it's not exactly on the same line. It shifts over, but the same force and same energy, right? It just it just a redirected uh, kind of save thing, okay? So anyway, right? Uh, so where were we going with that, right? So I hit, drive this in, right? And then from right here, because this one's going to be harder and causing him to move, right? So we've got one, two, and from right here, I can just come right back in with the stow to the same, I'm hitting the same target, right? So one, two, three. Right. So there's no wind up. The, well, there is a wind up. The wind up in each strike is actually caused by the delivery of the strike before it. OK, so we've got this one. OK. There's the space. See what happens to drop this one in. My arm chambers first still. OK, one, two. I'm right there for the next one. OK. Again, just another one of those lessons I learned from Asumi Sensei a long time ago. And when I got it, probably like a lot of you that are watching, when I got it, it looked cool. But there was a lot that I had to figure out and learn before I could make this work, right? I mean, I tried to make it work, right? And sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. Well, at least in a dojo anyway, but not something I was going to like bet my life on, which is what you're doing every time you apply these things or every time you stop your training at a certain level, okay, and you decide... This is good enough. Okay. You think about this, right? Just like the executives uh, in corporations or hospitals or whatever, when I'm helping, when I go in and help with uh, workplace violence stuff, right? Whatever they've decided is enough. Okay. Workplace violence prevention policy, zero tolerance policy, whatever, right? What they are literally doing is betting their lives and the lives of everybody else that they're responsible for on that thing. It's the same thing with your skills. It's the same thing with your techniques. Every time you stop and you make the assumption that this is good enough, you better, you better understand that you're betting your life. Just like when you, when you select a martial arts teacher, right? What most people don't think about, especially the bunch of these martial arts teachers that walk around with their big old freaking chest sticking out and all that, right? What they never give any consideration to is that when a student comes to me or when I go to my teacher, right? I am placing my life and my well-being in their hands, because they're supposed to be teaching me this stuff, right? And I'm placing my life and my well-being in their hands until I reach a level where I can do this stuff for myself. I'm trusting them with my life. My students are trusting me with their lives, with their family's lives, okay? This is something that people need to take way more seriously. All right, but let me get off my pedestal, right? So again, Sanuch, just another aspect, right? Second aspect to this idea of triple striking, but it's more than just like strike combinations because people have their favorites and all that kind of stuff, right? What we want to do, what this is about really is about time. It's about creating time. It's about creating distance. It's about creating opportunity where it doesn't exist, okay? And it's maximizing the effectiveness of strikes so without having to work harder. Right. So instead of having to slam and slam, because that takes a lot out of you. Right. You see these guys at the end of a, at the end of a boxing match or an MMA fight or whatever. Right. Now, imagine at the end of that fight, somebody fresh jumps into the ring, which is what we may have to deal with. Right. We're out. We do this, taking this guy down. Right. I better have a whole bunch of stuff in reserves because if one or two of his friends comes rushing at me, holy shit, fight's not over. OK. The engagement with him is over. The fight's not over right? The survival situation is not over, right? These are things that ninja consider that the average martial artist or somebody on the warrior path or whatever probably doesn't, right? And again, the more we're involved in tournament game, that kind of stuff, right? And I, I don't mean game like it's like it's just for kids or whatever. I mean, it's rule-based and all that kind of stuff, right? The more we're indoctrinated into that, chances are the less we're going to recognize these other things. And you know, that's where my forte and some of my peers uh, out, in, out in this art, uh, that's where our forte is, right? We've ducked bullets, we've avoided knives, all that kind of stuff, right? And we're still here to talk about it. Few to no scars, lots of memories, that kind of stuff, right? But you got to do what you got to do, okay? So anyway, 
part two, I know not as long as our normal uh, lessons, but this should allow you to jump right to it. Don't forget, a couple hours, day or so, uh, jump over onto the website. You can go to onlineninjaacademy.com. Uh, we'll post a, a, the specific page that you can go to for the worksheet. As a matter of fact, it might be where uh, onlineninjaacademy.com forward slash worksheet for all I know at the moment, right? You can try it. Um, go there. You can get the get the worksheet. We'll have the links in the description down below or maybe some of these cards up here uh, for some of the other videos that that I, uh, I referenced. Right. That would be helpful uh, in picking these things up. up right. And also, uh, if watching this beyond uh, the end of October of 2020, uh, don't forget, we've got our uh, uh, yearly fall ninja camp intensive that's coming up. Right. We're going to be taking a look at bringing the traditional model for the Ninja no Hachimon, right? These uh, eight basic, eight, not basic, eight uh, requisite areas of training that somebody had to be doing to be able to claim to or for a school to claim to be teaching Ninja to or in ancient Japan. What we're going to be doing is bringing it forward and taking a look at what that would look like in the 21st century. And I don't mean making up my own freaking agenda. What I mean is Understanding the lessons, understanding the technology of the day, understanding the kotsu, the essential nature, and then what does that look like today, right? So we're not making shit up, okay? It's the same thing. It just has to look different because the attacks are different, the armor is different, the, all this stuff, okay? So anyway, that's what we got. Take a look at uh, the extra things we have waiting for you at the end of the video. Also, don't forget to grab the worksheet and all the other resources and stuff that we have for you. Don't ever skip the description stuff. I load a ton of stuff in there that's extra, right? It's like ninja secrecy, right? Okay, so if you're just hopping around looking at videos, I hope this was entertaining. If not, um, well, then may I suggest you went to the wrong video. Okay, that's it. Talk to you next week. Be safe. Train well.